Open your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter 3. I want to interrupt our study today in the book of Matthew to take you into my heart, into our community, into some of the things that we need to be aware of. We can turn the house lights up a little bit so that you can read along. I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 3 today. about a form of persecution that had come upon the children of Israel, specifically the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes of Israel, after the ten northern tribes known as Israel under that nomenclature had been scattered by the Assyrians. The children of Judah, as it were, and Benjamin, had been taken captive into Babylon. There in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold. Verse 1. The height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now this is in Iraq. The same city, the same location where you would see Babylon today. And King Nebuchadnezzar had made an image of himself to be worshipped. This is a precursor to an image that will be formed by people during the tribulation period, yet future. Empowered by supernatural demonic strength through the miraculous workings of the false prophet that will work directly with the Antichrist. And people will be forced to bow to a statue and to an image and to take a mark, the mark of the beast you're very familiar with, swearing your allegiance to the worship of a system and to a man that we call the Antichrist. This is a precursor. And this was taking place in relationship to the nation and people of Babylon and Iraq, Chaldeans, and the children of Judah and Benjamin, we commonly call the children of Israel. And so... This thing is set up in Dura, the province of Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So all of his officials, his administration, all of his governmental heads, down to the lowest levels, all of them participating. And then there was a cry that came forth, verse 4. To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and symphony, with all kinds of music, all the peoples and nations and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to or worshipped the golden image which you have set up. King Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the image which I have made good. So when you hear all this music, this is your second chance. You're going to, you're going to fall down and you're going to worship my image, and that'll be good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Now, first of all, let's talk about the fact that in Iraq, in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar has made this image and he's commanded all nations, peoples, and languages, and tongues, everyone on the face of the earth over which he at that time was the world power to worship his image. Everyone was called to worship his image. How many people said no? Three. Now you're talking about Israel. They knew God, see? They'd been called by God. They'd been given the promised land. They'd been, uh, made a covenant with God. God had made a covenant with them, I should say. And they had seen his miraculous powers. They knew him. He had delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, now, by this time, the people that were in Judah, the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, had seen the Assyrians come and be scattered by the Assyrians. The, the, the northern tribes were completely wiped out, taxed, first of all, tormented, made slaves, and ultimately killed, tortured, worse than anything ISIS has done by the Assyrians, who are known in history as the most cruel enemy. They, they, were, they boasted in their cruelty toward others. And the children of Israel, the ten northern tribes, ultimately scattered. And the two tribes, the southern tribes, watched. And they didn't repent of their sins were taken by the thousands into Babylon. And only three said, we'll stand. And so the question that comes up and has in part been answered already is, why were the children of Israel in Babylon in the first place? Having been delivered out of Egypt, having watched the Assyrians come and torture and torment and kill and scatter the, to the ten northern tribes, the southern tribes should have repented. They should have said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got to do what God is telling us to do. Look at the problems that are happening in the north, but we will not obey God. We're going to do our own thing. That's what they said. They were going to sacrifice their children, just like people do in America today with abortion or in the systems of education that teach them ungodly principles. Not standing up against it, but condoning. The children of Judah and Benjamin, Israel, seeing all of this, were taken captive and they were taken into Babylon through Ramah. Now, in the storyline of the birth of Christ, you talk about when Herod came in and slaughtered all the firstborn in his effort to try to kill Jesus. 
Now, what we have is a prophecy and fulfillment that is referenced in Matthew, early Matthew, where it says that Rachel was weeping for her children. A crying out was ma being made known in Rama. What is that? What is that referring to? But that the Babylonian exile, they used as their train station, if you will, the city of Rama. They would take all the people to Rama and then they would export them to Babylon. And now the children of Israel there in Babylon are commanded to worship a foreign god, to pay homage to a foreign god, not having learned their lesson. And only three men would stand up. Now, you have to know that early on, prior to the Assyrian dispersion and prior to the Babylonian exile, God had prophets that spoke, calling the people to repentance. And small pockets of people occasionally would listen. Some people would repent. Even at times in the history of Israel and Judah, there were some uh, levels of repentance that are noted in the scripture. But ultimately, their hearts continued to go after their own selves, their own ways, and foreign gods. And God had told them that if they would obey him, they would be blessed. And if they disobeyed him, they would be cursed. And they did not take God seriously. You're asking yourself, well, why are you telling us this, Paul? I'm telling you this because we've done the same thing in America. The church has been asleep for too long. The church has been engaged in doing its own thing for too long. Now, there are pockets, there are people, you know, that are earnest about their faith and they stand up and they speak the truth. And I'm glad for those people. I'm glad for the pulpits in America that's engaged with a bold message of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a high standard of godliness and moral living. But that isn't the case with everyone that calls themselves a Christian. It isn't even the case with everyone who is actually a Christian in America, nor has it been in times past in other parts of the world. And so, all of the sudden, you ask, why am I in Babylon? <laughs> well, because we disobeyed the Lord. We did not attend to the things of God the way we should have. We were too busy doing our own thing. Remember when the children of Israel had returned from Babylon, they still hadn't even learned their lesson to the degree that when they went back to build the temple, they got discouraged because of some persecution and they decided just to build their own houses and never mind. When are you going to learn your lesson, you might say to the children of Israel? Well, they haven't learned it yet. They're still blind to this day. There's a day coming when this image that will be erected during the tribulation period will be in front of the world and everyone will be commanded to worship the beast and his image, take his mark, pay allegiance to him. Only at the end of the tribulation when Israel has been driven all the way to their knees will they ultimately bow before God and say, God, I'm helpless, I need you, and he will come and rescue the remnant of Israel. And there's a church in America today that needs to be rescued. There's a church in America today that needs to hear the voice of one crying in the wilderness, if you will. The many prophets that are still prophesying around this nation, and yet the majority of the Christian population isn't listening. Too busy doing their own thing. I'm going to talk to you like men today. That includes you girls. Last May 2013, there was a 
move by the LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, transsexual, bi, or, trans, bi, bi, whatever, <laughs> bisexual, transgender community to get an ordinance passed in the city of Coeur d'Alene that gave special rights to the LGBT community. Their privileged status would be at the expense of others. And for that reason, then, I contested with the city, as did 400 other people that went with me to the city council meeting after I had written in the paper, after I had spoken with the candidates on the uh, uh, issue in the city council meetings and the mayor herself, and sought for their understanding of what they were about to do, and at which time I was called a bigot and a hater. Why? Because the interpretation of anything that speaks for God is interpreted as hate for those who oppose God. I don't hate homosexuals. I don't hate transgenders or bisexuals or any other thing. But I hate what hurts them. I hate heroin addiction. I don't hate heroin addicts. I hate alcoholism. I don't hate those that are abusing alcohol. I hate what harms and so I will be called a hater if I'm going to speak up about what is harming others. I already mentioned to you that in May of 2013, when we went before the city council, I went as the president of the ministerial association, representing the few pastors that would stand with me, many of whom would not. Now we're getting personal. Because now we're talking about Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We're talking about pastors in Coeur d'Alene that would not take a stand. Don't put my name on that. Uh-oh. Probably going to lose friends. And 400 people went with me. And I want to tell you that it should not have been 400. It should not have been 4,000. It should have been 20,000. We failed. Now, when we went in, I told you before we went, we're going to fail. They're going to they're gonna pass this ordinance. Even though the ordinance, as is promoted by the LGBT community, was an ordinance that was supposed to be, you know, equal rights for everyone, it was not equal rights for everyone. It was privileged rights for the LGBT community. And it was a persecution against you who did not want to participate. If you were a hotel owner, you said, no, I'm not going to rent a room to uh, a gay couple. Or if you are a wedding cake baker and you say, no, I'm not going to make a cake for a gay couple. Or if you are a photographer and you're not going to take pictures. And we've seen it in Portland, Oregon. We've seen it in Washington State. We've seen that people that said, no, we don't want to do that, have been persecuted. The bakers and the photographers have lost their jobs. And the florists. And we watch it on the news and we go, oh, look at that, Martha. Somebody, somebody else is getting persecuted. But it's not us. Somebody else. So we don't take it seriously. Well, the Assyrians, you know, uh, they, they look at all the northern tribe. They're getting scattered all over the place. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're being tortured and everything. It's not us. So we just keep on doing what we do. We have our idols of self and all the things that we engage ourselves in. But as long as it doesn't get close to us, it's okay. Why were these guys in Babylon? Could you imagine being in Babylon at that time? And you kind of go, <laughs> what are we doing here, man? You know? You go, we should have obeyed God, right? 
Daniel in chapter 9 prays at the end of 70 years in Babylon. He's praying, oh God, I confess to you the sins of myself. I confess to you the sins of my people. We have sinned against you. We rebelled against you. We didn't do what you said to do. And now here we are. And you, you told us we were going to be punished for 70 years. And God says to him, oh, but you forgot the passage in Leviticus. It says, for every time you sin, I'll multiply a curse upon you seven times. So now it's not 70 years, it's seven times 70, 490 years. You know the prophecy. I'm not here to talk to you about prophecy today. I'm here to talk to you about why we're in Babylon and what's happening in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Two, oh, wait a minute, don't say Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, that's, that's us. Yeah, I know. Two weeks ago, I was at a pastor's meeting. Pastors were discussing a problem in the community, and they said, Paul, you need to write an article to the paper. <laughs> well, hey, the thing is, is I've done that many times, as you know. And as the president of the Ministerial Association, my voice at times speaks for a group. And as they were telling me this, and I'm reflecting on the fact that the last time I wrote in the paper, I was called Hitler, the reincarnation of Adolf, or of uh, Richard Butler, uh, hater, and all these things. No bother to me. I don't mind if you call me a hater because I do actually hate what harms people. Okay, I want you to let that you know soak in before the day's over. But I told them, I said, no, I'm not writing it. I'm not going to write it because if I write a letter, it's one voice speaking for a multitude. What we need is a multitude to speak. No longer one voice, no longer a representative. Okay, I'm the elected official. I'm the representative. And that one voice, and, and I bark my little head off, and the few people that want to uh, be naysayers, they'll even, even gather up others. When, that, when this bill was being passed in our own community, they brought people from other states to speak. We had 400 people there. Shame on us for having only 400 people there. We should have had more people there than go downtown on 4th of July. The, the streets should have been all jammed up. Don't clap. It's, I'm not asking for applause. I'm, I really am not asking for applause. I know it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And all the other niceties that I could say, but I'm kind of ticked off today, so. There. I know. I know. It's all good. But I want you to hear me because I, I, this is important. I, I wish that we had jammed up the streets. I wish that they had said, oh, no. We really got a problem. Now, see, we actually could have held back, held back that decision. Now, the decision would ultimately be made. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, but Paul, we're living in the last days. The Bible says wicked men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get so bad that ultimately at the end, it's going to be one of those questions about when the Son of Man returns, will there even be faith on the earth? I mean, we, got, we have this idea that it's going to get so bad that what's the point? But the point is that we are called by God to occupy until he comes and to contend for the faith and to stand up for truth for if not yourselves, your kids and your grandkids, because we don't know when Jesus is returning. Now, I don't want to tell you today that he is not returning today. He could return today. I believe in the doctrine of imminency, and I believe that Jesus Christ could come for his church today. That is the blessed hope of the believer. Hope. I want you to have hope. But your hope is not in this world, and your hope is not in these times. But you as a believer are called by God to have hope, to do something, to move forward, not to lay down and say, it doesn't matter, it, we're all going to lose anyway. No, we could have risen up and said, no, 10,000 people down at City Hall, 20,000 people down at City Hall. And I know this is getting a little too personal because we're talking about Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. But now all of a sudden you're going to ask yourself in a minute, why are we in this place? What happened? And so what was this that I needed to write an article about? What was it that the pastors wanted to talk to me about? Well, it was coupled together with a phone call I got from a couple of people that are Christians, husband and wife, who run the hitching post. The hitching post in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. 
And they came and they said, Pastor Paul, we need to talk to you. And so I made them an appointment to come to see me, not just me, but the other pastors during the uh, pastoral meeting and gathering. And I said, I want to hear your story. Tell us your story. Now, I read the paper like you guys. You know that there's some stuff going on. If you don't read the paper, start. Pay attention. And so they said, we have talked to the city attorney. Now, we're not talking about the city attorney in Babylon. We're talking about the city attorney in Coeur d'Alene. And they told us that if we don't do gay weddings, that we will be arrested and we will be fined. This is exactly what we were trying to fight in May of 2013. We were not anti-homosexual. We were pro those guys. We were pro the gym owner that says, I don't want a guy shaving his legs in the girl's locker room and not have a way to stay and say no because he's a transgender. You never know what he is. And now he's going to go to the girl's locker room. He's going to go to the guy's locker room. Hey, there's no standard. And that's what's happening is we're lowering the standard, lowering the standard until we are a blithering mess of cesspool garbage. Sorry. I'm trying not to cuss on Sunday. <laughs> And so they said, we came here for advice. We need advice. I said, well, what are you thinking? That's my MO. I always like to let people think for themselves, you know. And they said, well, we're thinking about closing down the hitching post. They're thinking they're, they're going to quit. Husband and wife team, they've been married forever. Beautiful, beautiful, godly Christians. And they use this as an opportunity to share the gospel with people that are unchurched, that don't go to churches. And got around the table for a while, some discussion, pastors making comments, they making comments in response, and it got back to me. And they said, Paul, what do you think we should do? And I said, have you considered another option? And they said, well, what's that? Their eyes got as big as saucers. I said, have you considered going to jail? And then I interrupted and I said, I actually figured I'd be the guy because I'm the mouthpiece and I'm the spokesman and I'm the most hated pastor in town, it seems, because he's the Adolf Hitler of candle or of, uh, you know, candlelight or a court lane. And, uh, you know, people run for their lives from getting away from this church because they don't want to be identified with me, the evil one. And I told him, I says, I thought I would be the one to go to jail but it looks like the onus is upon you. And Tim Remington said, yeah, we thought you would be the one. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't kidding. And I figured Tim would be right behind me. Because, see, I knew this would be tested. Guys, this is happening everywhere. Our government's already caved in. Our schools have caved in. Our institutions, our hospitals are caving in. Our, our businesses are caving in. Nowadays, if you work in any corporate setting, you've got to go to touchy-feely meeting so you can learn how to be touchy-feely and not hurt anyone's feelings today. You don't have a right to your opinion. You don't have a right to speak up. You've got to be nice. You know what? I'm tired of being nice about things that kill people. And so I said, have you considered going to jail? And I was like, oh, no, I, I can't even imagine it. And I said, I will bail you out. I was serious. I said, candlelight will stand behind you. And candlelight will bail you out. And candlelight will go with you to court. And candlelight will contend for you. Candlelight will pay your fine. It was terror on them. They're, they're, they were trepidatious. This is not a young 35-year-old couple. This is a couple that had been married, I think, 45 years. And they were frail. They were weak. You could tell. It was hurting them. And I was being serious. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road, candlelight. Just as has been true in so many places around the globe, 
we, politically speaking, go to foreign countries to fight battles with, for example, uh, the Islamic radical. Because we think, well, if we don't do it there, we'll be doing it here. If we don't fight on their soil, we're going to end up having them here. Well, too late. But here's the problem. I'm going to make this very real for you. We're no longer playing church. This is happening in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And if we don't fight this battle at the hitching post, you will fight it here at Candlelight. They're going to come. Because they've already won the hospital and they've already won the politicians and they've already won their way through the systems. They've won their way through the public schools. There's only one place left to go and that's the church. And they are after the church. The IRS is after the church. Everything is coming down on the church. It is now persecution time in America. Are you sober yet? Aren't you glad you came to church today? I came because I want to hear five points of how to be a better human. I'm going to tell you how to be a better human. And it's going to take courage. It's going to take fortitude. It's going to take the spirit of the living God at work inside your frail humanity to stand up now not tomorrow and not because it's happening to those guys because it's happening to you now let me just tell you what i'll finish the story let me tell you what happens with old shadrach meshach and abednego oh nebuchadnezzar we shouldn't even have to talk to you about this you see, it's like Peter and John. They said, whether it is right to obey God or man, you decide. It's not a choice. <laughs> see, this isn't optional. The rest of Israel is all bowing to this statue as so many churches are today. The Methodists and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and denominational churches across the board uh, are debating it, many of whom have already caved in. And they just said, well, we're just going to adopt the whole thing. It's all good. It's all fun. You know, we, we should embrace. You can embrace the heroin addicts. Heroin? And you're going to help them shoot up? No. You're going to stand in the way and say, hey, man, wait a minute. Let's do what we can to talk to you about this. It's hurting you. Okay? And I'm not talking about politics, you guys. This is not a political sermon. I'm talking about being a Christian in a world where there is persecution against real Christians. And it's not just happening over there for somebody else. It's now happening to you. In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, at the Hitching Post. I hope that these two are brave enough to do it, to stand up, and that we can go fight for them. If they're not, we're next. Children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they say to Nebuchadnezzar, hey man, I'm just going to tell you something. This is Paul Van Oy paraphrased edition. We're just going to tell you something. <laughs> Our God is able to save us from you and from your fiery furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. But I want you to know something there, Barney Ubozo. That's Nebuchadnezzar for short. <laughs> this is the Paul Van Oy paraphrased edition. I told you that. We're not going to bow to your statue. And our God will save us. And even if he doesn't save us, we are not bound to your statue. Well, they heated the furnace seven times hotter. They threw him in. You know the deal. By the time they get let out, everyone's devastated because there's a fourth person in there. Translational issues. It was the Lord. And their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. But you know what? That's not what happened to Paul. Paul lost his head. Peter was crucified upside down. Nathaniel was skinned alive. John boiled in oil, put on the island of Patmos. Do I need to go on? Thomas was torn in 
two or in in four parts. They tied a, something around each wrist and re, each an, uh, ankle, and they ran horses in different directions and ripped his body to pieces. That is your family. Well, that was two thousand years ago, Pastor. That's not happening here. No, it's on the other side of the world in Saudi Arabia. It's not happening here. Oh, but now it is. Now you've got to wake up. And so here's the altar call. We need to respond. How? What can we do? Number one, we need to pray. We need to pray first. I would say, I'm going to make it selfish. Pray for yourself. Pray that God will give you courage. Pray that God will give you grace to stand against the tide of evil. This is an evil agenda. This, this, this is only one. I mean, we could be talking about abortion. We could be talking about all kinds of things. This is just one item on the list of antichrist behavior. And they're telling us to bow. And we will not. What, don't you love Nebuchadnezzar? He's a nice guy. He gave you fruit, you know? No, well, don't laugh because, see, I insert little pieces of humor for your benefit. Otherwise, you start having a nervous breakdown because I'm losing it up here, right? <laughs> it's that comic reprieve ever so needed at the right time. Pray for yourself. Pray for your church. Pray for the other pastors. Pray for the other Christians in our city that they will have courage, too. I'll be talking about this with the other senior pastors. Some of them will not want to hear from me. Now I'm making enemies. I don't want to make enemies, but I'm telling you, there are pastors in this city that will not take a stand. Just like there's pastors all over the country that have not taken a stand and they are already bowing. So we pray. Number two, you speak up. The first thing we need to be speaking up about is the gospel, the good news. Every person that gets saved is going to turn from the sin that devastates whatever it is. And we need to be the people that are willing to share the gospel. People are over at the fairgrounds right now on your behalf doing that very thing. In the evangelism tent, there are people there ministering the gospel. Over there on the community stage right now, there's people singing Christian songs right now, telling people about the love of Jesus. I don't want to make you feel bad. But you know what's interesting to me? We, we got 500 tickets to the fair. I'm, this is getting too close to home, Pastor. Don't talk to us about us. Talk to us about the neighbors. Talk to us about other churches. No. We bought 500 tickets to the fair. There's 1,000 people that go to this church. And we had to turn back in 250 of the tickets, meaning only 250 people in this church bought a ticket to the fair. When we're having an evangelism booth there and when we have this community stage for the entire Sunday, from morning till night of the fair on the Sunday, and you don't want to go? Why? Why don't you want to go? Well, I'm busy. It's barbecue season. You know? Hey, man, get an elephant here. For Christ. <laughs> Preach that over at the fair, right? Elephant ears for Christ. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I don't want to guilt anybody, but I want you to, to wake up and smell the coffee. I want you to, to realize, hey, wait a minute. This is us we're talking about here. 
We only had 400 people that made it down to the city hall in, in May. We had 1,000 members of a church. We should have had at least 1,000. Well, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's during football. I'm not saying it's wrong to watch football, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have a barbecue. You know, not everybody's going to be there all the time. But you know what? We ought to be supporting. We ought to be doing. We ought to be giving. People in this church need to start giving. There's a lot of people that go to Candlelight that do not financially support this church. You need to stop that. Why? Because what we do is we invest ourselves in the gospel that we're preaching. Oh, don't talk to us about our money. That's it. We are leaving. Okay? You need to speak up and proclaim the gospel. Get behind it with your life. Show others that you care about them. Okay? And then on the issues. You need to speak up on the issues. Well, I can't. I'll lose my job. Well, you might lose your job. Now, there's a time and a place. Don't stop working so that you can preach to somebody. Okay? Because then you're stealing from your employer. But you can let your life so shine before men that they will see your good work and glorify your Father in heaven. You can talk to them at lunch. You can talk to them beforehand. You can start sharing with people about the times in which we live. Guys, if you are reading your Bible, you know we are living in the last days. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. There was an earthquake in California today. Do you guys watch the news? Do you know what's happening all over the world? The, this ISIS problem is just a small segment of the Muslim invasion of our planet. And it's only one of the invasions of our planet. A holocaust of babies being killed. Abuses of all kinds. Marriages breaking down. The best testimony you can be to a homosexual is a great marriage. Show them what it looks like to have a great marriage. It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Okay? I'm not anti-gay. I'm anti what harms the gay okay and i'm pro god and i'm pro truth and there's no more time for games so we speak up on the issues you get involved number three get involved i want you to think about writing letters when the pastors say pastor paul you better write a letter no you write a letter read the paper there's enough people in just candlelight that if every one of us were writing letters to the editor, they would not know what in the world hit them. They would say, what in the world is happening? You say, well, I'm not a very good writer. I don't care. Write three sentences and send it. They'll print it. Let them have a backlog. Say, not on my watch. Nuh-uh. I'm not going to let you do that to these people. I can't wait to see what happens if this couple at the hitching post say, no, we're going we're to fight this. And they go to jail. I will find out who the real Christians are real quick. Because the real Christians are going to stand up and say, okay, we're here to bail them out, all of us. What? There's 5,000 people at the bail bondsman's. Yeah. So we speak up. We write letters to our legislators. We write to the press. You you get involved. Don't wait till it's somebody else's job. Do it yourself. No more excuses, you guys. This is where the, the real men come out. This is meat for men. I know this. Next Sunday, we'll have a very nice, happy sermon. Okay? I promise. Daryl Craft will be teaching next week. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, I love Daryl, and I support his message. Believe me. And you'll need it after today. <laughs> Some of you probably won't come back to candlelight after today, though. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope not only that, that you will come back, but that you will invite your friends. Because now it is high time to awake out of sleep. The night is far spent. And you guys, we need to be the most loving, the most godly, the most powerful people in this county so that people will literally line up to get into this building, not run away because it's too controversial. You have any idea how many times I've had letters from people leaving the church because I talk about politics? Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot divorce your faith from your politics. You are a Christian. It affects everything. And we won't shut up and we won't sit down. 
we're going to stand and we won't bow. And so I'm going to just give you this in closing. A couple of things you need to think about, pray about, and don't say, well, we didn't know, because now you, you do. The convoy of hope, the day of hope that's coming up in Coeur d'Alene is a way for you to let your light so shine before men. Friday night, the 5th of September, we're talking about a couple of weeks from now, guys. We're, it's not like, oh, I'll forget. No, well, we won't let you forget. It's going to be in the bulletin on the website. It'll probably be on the marquee, that new flashy sign you guys got out there. There will be a gathering at North Idaho College at 6 o'clock in the Schuler Auditorium, which only seats 1,141 people. I think candlelight should be able to fill it by ourselves. New life's involved, real life's involved, Lake City Community Church is involved, Coeur d'Alene Assembly's involved, Coeur d'Alene Bible's involved. Believe me, there should be enough people to volunteer to serve this community the love of Jesus that we cannot fit in any facility. I want to see people standing all over the place going, we want to serve, we want to serve. And the convoy people going, whoa, we only printed 500 green t-shirts. There's, there's 5,000 people. I want them to see that. We can show them that. That's just one way of voting with your life. Then you come and you serve at the Convoy of Hope. We're expecting between three and 5,000 people to be there to be served tennis shoes and backpacks and food. Remember the guy in the video last week? They're giving away free food, man. Right? Hey, it's because we love people in our community. We actually love them. And we're not going to say, are you a homosexual before we give you this food? No, we're going to give them food because we love them. We're going to love everyone, no matter who they are, adulterers and adulteresses and drunkards. We're going to give them food and we're going to give them the love in Jesus' name. Then I would like you to show up Two Sunday nights from now, September the 6th, 7th, at the Hitching Post. We're going to do a prayer meeting there. Now, the Hitching Post can probably hold all of 50 people. That means we're going to spill out onto the lawn, out all over the place. Yep. And we're going to be out there praying and I want the Coeur d'Alene press to be out there with a photographer going, oh, no. I want the city attorney to think about what they're about to get themselves into. This is war. They're the ones that called it, not me. But I'm ready to fight. And I'm not fighting against anybody. I am fighting for a couple of Christians in our city that are being persecuted for their faith. Now, as the organist slowly begins to play, <laughs> we're going to have an altar call. But before you get out of your seat to come to the altar, I'm going to turn you around and the altar is going to be the hitching post. Stand up if you're with me. Take a stand. Amen. Christ the royal banner leads against the foe forward into battle see his banner come on Brenda help me onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus with the cross of Jesus 
going on before. Amen. 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 Amen.